John Fung would often say that when you're meditating, you're practicing how to die. The issues that come up in the mind are very similar to the issues that come, will come up then. There's distraction, pain, sleepiness. So it's good to learn how to deal with these things right now. Because otherwise they'll get in the way. That's the other part of preparing for how to die, is seeing the Buddha's analysis of what happens. We talk about mindfulness of death. We focus on the fact that it could come at any time. But you could take that fact and do a lot of different things with it. One common attitude is, of course, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. In other words, try to stuff your time up with as many pleasures as you can. And if you had no control over the mind at all, and if the course of the mind didn't make any difference at death, then that would make sense. But in Buddha's analysis, the mind is making choices at that point. And the problem is it's often making the mind the power of aversion. It doesn't want to die, but it can't stay in the body anymore. And there's a lot of ignorance. And on top of that, there's desperation. That's the big difference between meditating and dying. With meditation, you can choose. Are you going to meditate right now? But when the time for death comes, you can't choose. You have to drop everything and be ready to go. So what skills we need? One is dealing with the distraction. You've got to keep your mind focused, because as the Buddha said, if we're going to be reborn, and for most of us, that's what's going to happen. Very few of us don't have to be reborn. But if we're going to be reborn, it's in line with our clinging and craving. The image he gives is a fire going from one house to the next, and it's blown from one, the first house to the second house through the wind. At that point, they believed that the fire actually clung to the wind, was sustained by the wind. And here we cling to craving. And what you crave will determine where you're going to go. That's a scary thought, because our cravings are often out of control. As the Buddha said, the mind is the quickest thing to change direction. There's nothing else that you could even think of as an analogy for how quick it is to change direction. So to keep it from changing direction in the wrong way, you've got to have very firm control over getting it pointed in the right direction, what the Buddha calls having yourself rightly directed, and then being mindful enough to keep it in that direction. So right now, as you find yourself sitting with a breath, and then suddenly someplace else, ask yourself, here I am sitting perfectly fine. The body's relatively healthy. And then look what the mind does. What are the warning signs? What are the warning signals? How do you know when it's going to head off to someplace else? And how do you talk it out of doing that? Because often there will be a little signal inside. As soon as the boss isn't looking, let's go. And then it stops. Then it comes back again. When the boss isn't looking, let's go. It gets more frequent. And then finally, when you do have a moment of a lapse of mindfulness, there it goes. So watch out for those little voices. They're there. So you have to learn how to keep yourself as quiet and as alert as possible, looking for those little signals that get sent through the mind. As you're dealing with the breath, one way of obliterating those signals is to try to make the breath as comfortable as possible, as gratifying a sensation in the body as you can imagine. Which means you have to ask yourself, which parts of the body are not particularly enjoying the breath right now? 
In what ways is the breath getting mechanical? Give it a sense of real pleasure right here. In other words, feed the mind so that it doesn't go looking other places for its nourishment. With pain, you have to be able to separate your awareness of the pain from the pain itself. And a lot of this has to do with how you talk to yourself about the pain. First, of course, is the conversation that says, this shouldn't be here, I don't want this. But they say, well, there it is, what are you going to do? And you can take medicine sometimes and it will go away, but other times it just doesn't go away. That's not the case that it doesn't have the right to be there. It's the nature of the body. This is why we have that chant again and again. Aging, illness, and death are normal. We're subject to these things, and the Thai translation is they're normal. Pain is normal. So what are you going to do about it? If something that's normal like that, you have to learn to live with it but not suffer from it. This is why we make that distinction between the suffering of the three characteristics and the suffering of the Four Noble Truths. In fact, the things are fabricated means they're going to be stressful. That's the nature of fabrications. And the stress in inconstancy is something that's not going to change. What you can change is the stress that comes from craving and stress that comes from ignorance. That doesn't have to be there. That's the optional part. So you have to ask yourself, where are, going to, where are we going to find ignorance? The Buddha says, look at the fabrications in the mind. The way you fabricate the in and out breath, the way you fabricate your thoughts, the way you fabricate your perceptions and feelings. Try to be as really clear as possible on these things. In particular, the perceptions. One of the points that the Forest of Johns make again and again is if you want to understand all five aggregates, get so that you know one really well. And the one they all seem to focus on is perception. Seeing how arbitrary your perceptions are can help loosen up a lot of the firm assumptions you have about things that are making you suffer. This has got to be that way. That has got to be this way. But if thinking that things have to be a partic that particular way is making you suffer, why hold on in that way? There must be another way to approach things so you don't have to suffer. Remember, right view. Our hunts have right view, and they don't suffer. They're with pain, but they're not suffering from it. They're with difficult situations in life, and they don't suffer from them. So the fact that you're suffering means that there's a wrong view in there someplace. So when you can identify the different perceptions that go around pain, and the different stories that go around pain, ask yourself, can you change the perception? Can you change the stories? So that they're true. But they don't stab you. Because when death comes, it's going to be a lot of pain. That, for a lot of people, is why they can't stay in the body. It just gets too painful. They're being pushed out. And again, because there's a sense of desperation that goes with that, they'll just jump at anything. That's not a position you want to be in. The more you can be with pain and not suffer from the pain, then the more choices you'll see. And you jump at the first option. Because often the first option comes immediately after the thought, I don't want to die. And then you can come up with all the different reasons why you don't want to die. And you're going to latch on to those. You've got to tell yourself, okay, it doesn't matter whether you want to or not, it's happening. 
you've been practicing all this time, bring out your skills. And of course there's the problem of sleepiness. As the body wears down, you get more and more groggy. There's less and less energy. You have to learn how to maintain alertness even in the midst of that. One of the better techniques I've found is to take an interest. What are the signs of the body that tell you, okay, I'm getting sleepy? What are the sensations around the eyes? What are the sensations in different parts of the body that you take as signs you've got to sleep? And question them. The fact that you're taking an active interest in something can help at least to keep a lot of the sleepiness at bay. Now, if it so happens that you die in your sleep, apparently what happens is that you wake up enough to know that you're dying, which is why you want to keep the Buddhist teachings in mind some about what actually happens then. You do have a choice. If you're going to go with craving, choose your best craving. Crave to come to a place where you can practice. This is one of the reasons why the Ajahn's like to recommend a meditation word, to hold that in mind. Because at that point, there's a lot you can't hold in mind, but a simple word like that you can. And that word will have been invested with a lot of meaning. Bhutto, awake, is their favorite one. But you can use any that has some meaning for you. That acts as a signal to remind you of what needs to be, to be done, that will wake you up. So the mind is in a position where it can make a good choice at that point. So the skills you develop as you meditate are precisely the skills you're going to need at the moment of death. So take them seriously. Give your full attention to mastering them. And this is one of the reasons why we practice concentration, is to give the mind direction. That's the most important thing you're going to need at that point. You'll need a direction. And you need to be able to stay in that direction. So learn how to fight the mind's tendency to be switching direction so quickly, so easily. That's probably the most important skill you can muster. It requires a lot of mindfulness, a lot of discernment. But these are precisely the things we practice, we develop, as we point the mind at the breath and keep it there. At the moment of death, you will have to leave the breath, but you will have learned a lot about the mind in the meantime. And that should be enough to keep your head in the right direction.